I personally love history because it tells the stories that matter to communities. And that's why I love the local history in particular is it tells you about a local area and about their needs and interests at any given time. A big need in communities like Red Deer is to make sure that we're recording our local histories, to listen to the stories that your aunts and uncles and grandparents are telling, and make sure that you're passing those down to your children as well. You, you can, with a flip of a switch, learn more and more about what's happening in a remote part of the world. It's a little bit harder to find out about where you're actually living. There's an all-weather ford across the Red Deer River, a little bit upstream from the current site of Red Deer. And a settlement started there. It was known as Red Deer River Crossing. It was a place where the early explorers, the early missionaries would stop as they're traveling between Fort Edmonton and Fort Calgary back and forth. So we had the Red Deer Crossing uh, established as a small settlement, a uh, trading post, and the freight lines, stopping houses, all of that. And so you, you have some settlement around there, but that was essentially what seemed to be becoming the town center. That all changed though with a retired minister by the name of Leonard Gates and the Saskatchewan Land and Homestead Company. They bought a huge block of land, about 180 sections of land in and around Red Deer. And when they were talking about building the railroad, they made an offer to the railway company, they said, if you build the new town site on your rail line on our farm, we will give you half of our farm. Now they were smart, they didn't divide the farm in half and say, well, this side is yours and this side is ours. It was 50% share. So when they created the town site, then every time they sold a lot, 50% went to the gates, it's 50% went to everybody else. Now, with the original settlement site being a little bit farther west, people wanted to be on the railroad, you know, transportation, communication link. For the railroad company, it was great. I mean, they made a lot of money off this town site that helped make them very profitable. For Gates, it was wonderful. I mean, he had 11 kids, and when each of his daughters got married, he made so much money from his share in the new town site that he was able to give each daughter a house on 56th Street as a wedding present. And in fact, that 56th Street, as it's currently called, in the old days, they called it Son-in-Law Avenue because Leonard Gates' daughters and sons-in-laws all lived along there. We used to have an old saying in Red Deer, that there was Red Deer was sort of the Gates family and everybody else. And there even was a little rhyme that said, there's a Gates on every corner, there's a Gates on every stair, if balloons become the fashion, there'll be Gateses in the air. A lot of people in here were Gateses or Gates relatives. One thing I find personally interesting is that a lot of people approach history and they think that it's this happened at this time in this place with this person and it's very black and white. But what you'll find when you study history is that it's actually a lot more complicated than that. The rail line moved the settlement itself from where it was growing at the Red Deer Crossing into what we now consider the city of Red Deer. We have a creek that goes to the center of Red Deer, Waskasoo Creek, which is noted for beavers living along. It still is, you know, in an urban area, you still have beavers and beaver dams, and people love going down to the creek to look at the beavers. So that's really an inherent part of Red Deer. Back in 1939, there was a, 
a young schoolgirl. Her name was Jean Ewell, and she found a kit or baby beaver lying on the sidewalk. Its mother had been killed, and the little kit had been mauled, probably by dogs. She walked to a nearby house, which was owned by the Forbes family, and said, you know, I found this thing, you know, what can you take it? Mrs. Forbes was a, was a nurse, so she literally patched the beaver up. And then the question is, well, what are you going to do with an orphan beaver? They had a girl, a little girl, her name was Doris, looked a lot like Shirley Temple, and she and the beaver bonded very much. There was a very talented writer and ranger by the name of Carrie Wood, and he wrote the story of Mickey the Beaver. The story became very popular. All kinds of people were stopping by the Forbes place all the time. They got, you know, 100 letters a month. It's before the days of internet and email. My father was a writer, and when I was growing up, he was busy writing and creating all kinds of stories about local things of Red Deer and about local and regional history. In 1964, my dad produced a Mickey story told from the perspective of Doris. So my dad wrote about how Mickey came into the Forbes family. I knew right away that I wanted Mickey for a pet. Went uptown and saw Sergeant Matheson of the RCMP, and this policeman said it was all right for us to have Mickey. Beavers belong to the government, so a person needs permission to keep one. I found out later that Sergeant Matheson and my dad and mom didn't think Mickey would live, but I knew he would. Now originally it's a little baby beaver fitted in the side of your hand. It became a great big fat beaver later on because it ate well. But it became quite domesticated. I mean, it knew its name. If you called Mickey, it would come. One story Doris told me one time was that uh, she got whooping cough or some bad respiratory thing. And she's in bed with a very bad coughing spells. Well, the beaver come out quite concerned about her. It would kind of curl up and she would cough and then it would mimic her cough. <laughs> sure, sure. The bond between them was terrific. Mickey the beaver was a celebrity quite young. There were stories written in newspapers, magazines all across Canada, America. It was supposed to be featured for a Hollywood movie, but I don't think the movie ever was produced, but they did come and film it. But also famous people like Lady Baden-Powell, the head of the Girl Guides, when she came to Red Deer 46, one of the things she asked for was, can I see Mickey the beaver that I've heard about? And can I hold him? By the way, Mickey loved to be held. He loved to be cuddled. He did not mind having attention. Eventually, Mickey got quite old, and Doris said, Mickey used my old sweater as his pillow once again, and sometime during his sleep he had died. We were a sad family that day. My mother made a wooden casket and dug a grave for him in a corner of the lawn where we had spent so many hours with him. Mickey had been a happy animal all through the nine years he had been with us. And it was partly because Mickey had been a happy animal that my dad felt the whole story of Mickey the Beaver should be remembered. Women's hockey is actually much more deeply rooted in Canada than I think a lot of people realize. I mean, we do say it's our national sport. Not really that surprising then that women would want to play hockey just as much as men would. My mother was born in Minnesota. Her name was Marjorie Marshall. She came to Canada when she was four. So my mother got propped up for her brothers to use as a goalie. 
when she was very small, maybe five, maybe four, we're not sure. Fast forward to when she went into Red Deer to high school, and everybody apparently was asked if they would do a sport. So the teacher said, Marjorie, do you have a sport? Well, yes, it was hockey. Oh, what position did you play? Goalie? And they were thrilled. A girl who had hockey experience was just what the girls needed in high school. And so she served as the goalie on the ladies' intermediate hockey team, which went and won awards and championships for several years. And eventually, the ladies' team became known as the Amazons, and they played such good hockey, and they beat practically everybody. I knew a number of women that played in the famous Amazons, the earlier version. Evie Jenner and Lil Scott, her sister. I knew the Stevenson sisters. Mrs. Fox, Helen Hayho Fox. She played for wonderful athletes, wonderful women, uh, really good people. To show you how strong the team was, there was one player, her name was Adeline Stevenson, and she played three periods of hockey. And after the hockey game, she then entered the 880 speed skating race and finished second. Can you imagine playing three periods of hockey and then entering an 880 speed skating race? Those were first class athletes. By the late 20s, early 30s, we were a powerhouse for women's hockey. They won the provincial championships three times from season 32, 33, 33, 34, 34, 35. And in those three year period the time span, they only lost once. Red Deer's team was so strong that they played the national championships, the Eaton's team from Winnipeg, and they beat the national champions, but it was called an exhibition game so they didn't get to count it. But they really were a magnificent team. In fact, there were some complaints from the men's team that the women's hockey games often had much bigger crowds than the men were able to attract. Of course, the women's team were a championship team. Men's team in those years wasn't nearly as good. <laughs> So when we were forming the league in 2009, Central Alberta had the opportunity to choose a team and a, and a name for the team. And I went right back to our four sisters and I thought, I'm going to bring their spirit with us. And so the Amazons were reborn. Rhonda Wood is the daughter of the goalie of the original Amazon team that won the national championship. So we're honored to have Rhonda here today with us. Thank you for coming. Sarah, and we've got a little something for you to wear oh, today. Wonderful. <laughs> you're going to become an official Amazon. There, you're all geared up, ready to go. Words of wisdom for the young players of today? Be strong, you're Amazons. <laughs> Be big in heart, and big in intent, and score. <laughs> kids today would even know about the Amazons. They should be inspiring them. That teamwork is wonderful, and they won championships because they were so good. I'd like all of our Darians to know about our Amazons. Our players kind of know a bit of the history, and we're very proud of our name, and our players wear it 
fiercely and the Amazons of the 1930s went on to do great things in this community. That's what it's all about. It's about growing up in the community and having a lifelong experience in hockey. One of the things that's been very exciting about history is that we're now looking back and we're adding in the voices and experiences of people who were always there, but who never got to tell their story, who never got to be part of our story and how we establish ourselves for good or for conflicts. A rail line can start a settlement, but it can't necessarily build a community. Something like women's hockey and having a team to cheer for, having a key character like Mickey the Beaver as somebody to rally around and to get excited about, I think can help build that community and to reinforce that local identity and that local story.